Jennifer, welcome everyone. Welcome you, Debbie, and welcome um, the people in the audience to our, our uh, seminar um, as part of the seminar series, New Voices in Global Security. This seminar itself is a conversation EDI chat um, with Editor-in-Chief Debbie Lyle of International Political Sociology Journal. Um, so today we're just going to treat this as a conversation style. So please ask your questions either in the chat box, the question answer box, or raise your hands live, um, or raise your hands rather to ask your questions live to Debbie. So um, is there a gender and race gap in who publishes journal articles? I think this question is a little bit silly now, but um, it's been a question that's been posed numerous times in numerous studies across various academic disciplines and countries. And the answer is always overwhelmingly, yes, there is. More sticky questions that has underpinned emerging commentary within academic circles is why do these gaps exist? Um, how do they impact on our knowledge around war, conflict, security, and international relations? And how might including more diverse authors and indeed more diverse perspectives impact uh, what we know about global politics more broadly? So we have previously as a seminar series talked with Professor Andrew Dorman and Dr. Victoria Basham as both editors in chief of international affairs and critical military studies to gain better insights into how they come to think about EDI decolonizing and internationalizing knowledge, as well as those who produce knowledge. Today, I am so pleased to be joined by Professor Debbie Lyle, editor of International Political Sociology, and learn how IPS views these EDI issues and what the journal is doing to develop more inclusive spaces for publishing. Uh, the chat, like I said, is informal in nature and treat it more like a conversation. So again, please, as audience members who are tuning in, uh, do raise your Zoom hands to place your quest, uh, to ask your questions live to Debbie or, you know, place a question in the question box. And these questions can be any from banal to profound questions or comments. We'll take all of them. Um, and we're so pleased that Debbie has kindly agreed to give up her time today to talk to us about um, all of these issues. So a bit about Debbie, uh, she's a commissioning editor of International Political Sociology, I think I've mentioned that three times now, and she's also the prof a professor in the School of History, Anthropology and Philosophy and Politics at Queen's University Belfast. Professor Lyle's research engages with several contemporary debates in international relations, international political sociology and beyond, most notably around the issues of difference, mobility, security, travel, visibility, governmentality, biopolitics, materiality, technology, technology, practice, and power. Her earlier work explored the relevance of cultural and visual artifacts to world politics and argued that cultural realm tells us much about international relations as the official documents that are usually privileged within this context. More recently, Professor Lau's research has explored themes of tourism, militarism, and everyday life, borders, technology and security, uh, and war representation and surveillance. Um, Professor Lau's work is published in numerous international regarded journals and university presses. Welcome, Debbie. Um, thank you so much for joining us. So I guess uh, to warm up question for you, but also for the audience is I just uh, would like you to begin by just telling us a little bit about IPS as a journal and who your key audiences are. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm really pleased to see this conversation is happening um, and it's happening with um, PhD students and ECRs as well, because that's really, really important. Uh, I'll just, I'll say, yeah, a little bit about the journal. It's, a, I guess in journal, in the journal universe, it's a reasonably new one in that we're like 15 years old. So we're in the awkward teenage phase of being a journal. Um, it started, it's, a, it's one of the journals of the International Studies Association. They have about seven big journals in, in sort of big areas. Um, and as the title sort of suggests, it's not a beast that is wholly comfortable in the space of international relations because it's always traversing a number of different disciplines. So the transdisciplinary nature of IPS is really, really important. I think the way we often think about it is, is our work is situated between uh, international relations on, on one hand, 
political theory on the other, and then a the third hand would be sociology. So we're, we're constantly trafficking in between these three sites. Um, I would also say it, the, the commitment of IPS is really one of challenging conventional approaches to the global register or the global order. So we are about troubling conventional theories, conventional approaches, conventional methodologies that have reproduced what we might call the sovereign order. So I, so I, I guess one easy way to say that is some people would just say we would be at the more critical end of, uh, of IR, but, um, but drawing in a whole series of other traditions and conventions from other disciplines that, are, that share that affinity. So that, that gives you a little bit of a, a picture of what the, dis, of what the journal is. I guess one thing to say is that that's an important picture to have whenever you are thinking about submitting, because it's really important to know what journal you're submitting to when you when you submit something, because every journal is has a particular characteristic, uh, and you need to know what that is before you frame your your submission. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> Rookie mistake. Great. Um, that's great. And, you know, the the content and I guess, like you said, the, the transdisciplinary and more of a, a holistic understanding uh, of these issues that is your journal's remit, I think um, lends itself to more diverse voices and perspectives in the study, you know, of, of global politics more broadly. Do you have any um, stats to hand or reflections on how diverse, like around gender, around BAME, or what our Global South contributors um, to your journal are? And I could dig out the statistics if you want, but there is some, there actually is an important point about gathering the statistics and who does yeah. it, how we do it. Um, let me just say something, yeah. Let's talk like the way the easy way to think about this would be like content and form. So in the content of the substantive work that we publish, because of the orientation of IPS uh, and its its commitment to pushing against those conventional approaches, in the content of what we publish, like we are pushing against all of those questions. So all the questions about what we would do about gendered analysis, questions about race, questions about the decolonial, um, you know, questions, I don't, I don't want to use the word diversity. I'm not really a big fan of it, but, but really around bringing in voices, perspectives, orientations that, that have not been received well within the discipline of IR. We, we're, I think we're good at that. Mm -hmm. I think that's what the, I think that's what the journalists, so substantively, you can go back and see how different, um, different voices have been mobilized in the journal from the very start. So I think that's like one of those rare moments of like tick. I think we're I think we're doing. I mean, we could always do better, but I think we're not. We're okay. Where it gets difficult is in you might call the form or the structures around the journal. Um, let me say something about the gendered aspect of that first. There, there I, I, I'm the lead of the third editorial team, and the first two editorial teams were. Um, men and our editorial team is all female and that uh, that was sort of not deliberate it just happened in a way although these things are you know you whether they're deliberate or not or conscious or not but so there's four of us um Vicky Squire, Roxanne Doty, Alex Hall and myself and we work as a team senior senior team um to, to manage the submissions and what's interesting is um are the 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 gender balance of what we publish has shifted completely since we since we took over so we now and you can see the statistics of how that's happened and we publish more female authors than we do male authors um and and or like it's either we publish more or it's equal or more it's equal sort of thing. That's that's sort of where we're that's where we are at the moment. Now, that's something to that's good, but it's not the end of the story. And one of the really important parts of that story is around COVID, because <laughs> what we have seen absolutely, and you're seeing this across all journals, is um, it's not necessarily in terms of what's published, but submission numbers from female academics has gone like everywhere. 
everywhere. And that has to do with all kinds of things to do with COVID and mm-hmm. caring responsibilities, work balance, life balance, homeschooling, you know, you name it. And then I'd want to say something as well about those questions of form and structure around, I'm trying to think of what the language is, geographical dispersal. But what I mean by that is like, to what extent has the journal managed to um, reach out to publish, get reviewers, get on the end of scholars from the global south. And that is a story. Now, th- this is—I I know that lots of people don't agree with me on this, but my my view on this is that that is a story of failure, actually, because for a journal that is—and I say that like I'm I'm the editor, uh, and I'm saying it's a story of failures because for a journal that is so committed to um, bringing in voices into studies of the global register that have not been heard before and perspectives and orientations that's been the biggest struggle. Now I can list, you know, we can talk about the things we have done mm-hmm. right, to, to the, the, the techniques and the, the strategies we've used. But I guess what I would want to say is, um, this, is the, this is the biggest challenge that all journals have and we're not doing very well is the bottom line. So yeah. I mean, I'm happy to, I'm happy to talk more about that, but, I, but I, that, that would be like content doing okay, gender stuff, thumbs up. I mean, all to yeah. still be improved, but the question about let's just, I mean, I know the words are problematic, but let's just say like hospitality to global South scholars. Like, I don't think that that's a thumbs up at all. Right. What, what are the main sticking points here? I mean, um, I guess if we were reflect upon it, this is this is a, also a broader issue that, you know, uh, journals themselves are just one clog in a, a cog, rather in a broader wheel of you know structural and systemic points of exclusion, um, you know, periphery of being on, um, um, uh, you know, the the economic issues, let alone the other structural issues that make it more difficult for global South scholars to. Uh, to publish, but I wonder, like, have what 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 are kind of the sticky points for for you as a journal? Like, what do you think needs to shift and change here? Um, I mean, I would like it's really important to understand that interlocking the interlocking structures that journal, but also not just journals, but publishing, academic yeah. publishing as a whole industry, uh, is part of. Like, it's overwhelmingly. Anglo American, mm-hmm. uh, English language based, global north, like overwhelming. Um, but of course, the, it's it's not that there aren't there aren't the content about the global south happens in different ways. Now, IPS does it in a particular kind of way, which I would place as sort of critical as troubling as trying to be inclusive. But you know, you could read conventional IR that does stuff on the global south, but I would say it objectifies it. It yeah. really does all of that kind of work that IPS doesn't do. It won't do that. But the but the this I guess the system's broken, right? It's broken, mm-hmm. and this is where we see it. And I think, I guess there's 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 questions about like strategy. So like one thing that was interesting to me is um, the debates around like language, right? So when when we took over, the there were no abstracts it was only abstracts in English. So it took a number of years, but we finally have got those translated, but of course they're only translated into French and Spanish. Now that's better, it's better, Mm because we know how (laughs) colonization worked, right? It wasn't just um, Anglo people colonizing, right? So that, that, like, it's not, it, that did something. But there's also, it's also like, so one of the comments that happens when you get journal editors uh, talking to the Global South Caucus, for example, is this whole notion that there's an agreed upon standard of writing and an agreed upon standard of what's what good looks like. Mm-hmm. And of course there isn't. And this is where some of the debate is happening. 
Um, because a lot of, I've heard this from journal editors where they're like, well, it, it, it is, it's, it's the debate around standards, right? As if there's something that we all agree upon and have consensus that there's standards. And we have to reject these pieces from Global Southern Scholars because they're just not good enough. So then you get a whole series of like, well, let's mobilize some interventions around how we can intervene and teach Global South scholars how to get better at this. That's what the main focus is on <laughs> mainstream journals. And I'm like <laughs> dissatisfied with that for all kinds of reasons, not least of which the logic of intervention that it, that it reproduces. But it's also about like, getting in very, very difficult um, areas about writing, right? Like what type of writing, how we edit, how we revise, how we articulate and like the basic stuff about how you put an article together. And that there's no, there's like some consensus on like the big stuff, but like no. there's a lot, there's not a lot of consensus on, on what that is. Yeah, so what is the, what is the role of the reviewer in all of this or yeah you know because uh, yeah that the, I mean, we all lament about reviewer number two right yeah but, yeah what is the re role of the re reviewer and how how might they kind of play in a role in, in in facilitating the the pushback against this kind of colonial model of what academic writing looks like or the standard of academic writing um, enable more of or at least enable more of a, a support of um, you know different ways of um, I guess expressing um, yeah yeah I mean the one thing to say as well uh, just it, it like in a broken system the whole peer review system's busted because it's basically yeah. free labor yeah right? yeah and, yeah know, nobody, gets con nobody gets compensated for it I mean if you want to think about it in that transactional way and yet it's crucial to the whole system moving ahead, right? Like, you, so peer review holds up all of what we do. Yeah. We all believe in it and whatever, but it's, well, we know it's imperfect, but like, it's all, it's all free labor. <laughs> so I want to start there. Of course, it's like absurd in that sense. But in terms of the reviewer, right? So like I, it, as the editor, you see everything. And I have to say, I've been blown away by the, amazing work that reviewers for IPS do, like really constructive, um, really supportive, even on articles that aren't gonna make it over the line, like the, the work that, that reviewers do is really careful and like generative and intellectually generous and constructive. Mm -hmm. uh, like uh, that's my big picture piece, but I've also seen, of course, shocking stuff, like shocking. Right. of the how how could you fail to cite me i'm amazing to the like this is wrong because you haven't written the article that i want you to write to um you know reviews that are like four sentences like that you know like just so i've i've seen bad practice as well mm -hmm. and i actually think that one of the things that's happened is that we have failed to teach ourselves how to do good peer reviews. So there's like a some number of things that we're trying to do at the ISA that is about like, you know, passing that knowledge on because of course PhD students and ECRs don't have time to do reviews. They're too busy doing their dissertations and publishing, trying to get their work published. Yeah. But, but you learn how to write better by reviewing and understanding how people, I mean, it's a whole, it's a whole part of professionalization, but understandably, PhD students and, and ECRs aren't, they don't have time to do it. And we yeah. haven't taught them how to do it. And so like, there's a missing piece there. Um, but like, yeah, I get, I, I think there's just a, there's just a tone. It's massively gendered as well. Of course, surprise, surprise, it's hugely gendered, right? Like there's just some like assholes. There's just some assholes. And then there's like some really generative, constructive amazingness. Yeah, I don't know how to fix that either. I don't <laughs> We've got a few questions from our yeah. audience. Um, so here, okay, so, oh, Jim, but then Jim, I think has raised Jim's hand. So I'm just going to see if Jim is going to ask that question okay. live. Oh, great. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me? I can, hi, Jim. Yeah, hi. Uh, it's really great and refreshing to see people in IR talk about these issues because 
for decades, I would see people not talk about these issues. And I go back to uh, a comment somebody made to me in 1968 at Wesleyan, where she said that people were, who were interested in African studies were only interested in it for emotional reasons. And I know we're way past these kind of comments, but the problem I have with, uh, you know, watching and participating, I was educated at Columbia, uh, was the IR attitudes are so uh, in, entrenched in essentially reinforcing sort of traditionalist statist attitudes that anyone from the third world who would come up with different alternatives, and I'm thinking about the 1970s, you know, people are very much influenced by anti-imperialism, by Marxism and other issues. And they would just basically shun it aside as being intellectually irrelevant. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that of course caused a lot of resentment I think that's sort of one of the sources of the battles you see in academia today, because some of these people who were shunned aside finally got tenure and decided to take revenge on the other side. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, and, and, and we sort of see that. But on the same issue with the South, you know, they would essentially minimize and trivialize any serious intellectual looks that would attack dominant attitudes of hegemony in the academy that came from the South. And I saw that for, I've seen that since the 1970s on. And so how do you address that? Because that still remains the same in a way. Yeah. I mean, you look at how we're uh, processing Afghanistan, which is quite remarkable uh, and, you know, almost anthropological and, oh, it is anthropological. And, uh, and so I'm just wondering what you have to say about that. And I, and I do share your pain about being an editor. Uh, my former wife uh, still reviews a academic journal. So all the stuff you've heard about, you know, you're saying about these people will submit things, they get rebuffed, they get angry, they get egotistical. That happens all the time. But I think the more important thing intellectually to, 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 to argue about and work out is whole, this whole question of being able to understand the rest of the world, which I still think America is really backward in. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Jim. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, surprise, surprise, the discipline of IR uh, is, is not super global. <laughs> um, I mean, I laugh, but it's kind of a hysterical laugh affair, to be honest, because, uh, yeah, it's been going on for a long, long time. It still goes on, but it goes on, it now goes on in like, in particularly pernicious ways, I think. Those, those, those modes of dismissal that you were talking about, or minimalization or diminishing I, those are still happening but they're happening in in much more kind of detailed pernicious sneaky kind of ways i think because you can't get away with those big dismissal comments that you might have got away with in 1968 now we can talk more about that but but so uh, yeah i absolutely agree and what what interests me is like what interests me as well is are the different and understandably different positions that like, I'm thinking here about the Global South Caucus within the ISA, like the different positions that of course, scholars in the Global South have to this, right? Cause some are like systems broken. Like why would we ever want to participate in this system that was not built for us and is not hospitable to us? Like, you know, a totally legitimate position versus positions that are like, we need to put in place structures that will help us to um, to learn how to operate within this sphere of like journal editing and, and publishing, et cetera. And both of those things are true. And both of those things are valid. So it's also around, it's around attuning yourself into those debates as well. And those debates, those positions of course have been around for a long, long, long time. But it like, I, I never underestimate the discipline of IR's ability to be shocking in its, dismissal of the rest of the world. Like I never underestimate that. So, <laughs> I mean, I feel like um, do even doing like greater EDI work, you're constantly feeling like you're banging your head against the wall too, right? Because a lot of these, um, you know, the, the, the structural issues and the historical issues are so profound and often there's so many things that need to change often simultaneously that, yeah, um, and it, it can be frustrating. I just, I wonder, you know, for maybe the, the small changes, small steps. So us as, as academics, as ECRs located perhaps in the global North, but also in the global so South, what sort of advice would you offer us to, you know, be better allies to, 
or from the global south any sort of advice would you offer in 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 broader at getting access to publishing or what needs to be done I that's mean, probably not a very fair question sorry no, Debbie. i mean it, but well it's a, it's an important kind of it's an important thing to keep asking ourselves right because there like there are maybe some interventions that might be better placed than others. So I, I would often want to think about this in terms of um, collaboration or co-production rather than the preferred modality at the moment, which is mentorship. Because mentorship seems to me to be everybody, the professional managers use this as an answer to everything. We just mm -hmm. need more mentors or we just need whatever mm -hmm. without understanding that that in itself enacts a power relation, which is, crap but um it also it also undersells if you want to mentor i would say collaborate better that takes a lot of work a lot of effort a lot of resource and a lot of time which is right to do but again it's something else that's never compensated and surprise surprise it's gender right who does yeah. the mentoring women women are good at it you're so emotionally attuned you're really good at supporting people you know what i mean you've all we've all heard that so but there, there are like more modes of collaboration and co-production and support that can be put in place. So one thing that we have done at the journal, which again, hasn't really succeeded, but I think it just has to grow a little bit, which is we, we had this thing, we developed a thing called the Global South pre-submission initiative, which would mean scholars from the Global South could send us a piece that they wanted feedback on before they actually submitted it. So they didn't have to get their feedback by putting it through the system and getting a reject. They could give it to us. We put it to one of our comm scholars and they would get a round of feedback, right? And that feedback would help them to then revise the paper further. Now, as we anybody who's as old as me knows, the best writing happens when you're revising, right? The more yeah. you revise, the better it gets. And that's something we don't teach people either. but. But uh, so more feedback and then they can revise it. And so in advance of them submitting now that has, you know, we have done that for the last three years, but it hasn't had a huge take up. Right. And we don't know why. And we're trying to figure that out. Okay. I think something like that, that's, that's good. That's time. It's resource or whatever. It's not compensated, but I think it's important. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and the kind of support and collaboration I'm talking about, is often done one on one, right? So that I'm, well, I'm trying to think about how we might do that in in more collective settings. But that one on one work is it takes time and it takes effort and it takes resources and it's important to do. So so we need to do more of that. But like how we encourage and incentivize people to do that and resource it properly is not happening at all. Yeah, I mean, I see that uh, even just in um, my the own institute at King's, how we how we mentor and support ECRs, right? Um, and to really rethink mentoring itself and move away from this hierarchical kind of um, masculine form of knowledge, who the knower is, who the learner is, and all of that, um, to um, one that's based on horizontal, but also um, I think much more like um, you know. Uh, um how do we put it just like just advocacy work that are just um more work around just um opening up doors for people mm -hmm. you know um be being good um voices amplifying platforms amplifying voices of other people i did i heard um uh one of the panelists for another ecr event we had here um Ali Hawks uh, was talking about her experience. She works uh, within the broader global security industry. And she was talking about how women don't need any more mentors. We've been <laughs> over mentored, right? Done with that. We need people who will open doors for us, who will take a risk for us and, you know, get us into these spaces. And I think, you know, that I think that's something that we need to think about more, I guess, or that's something I've been thinking about more as someone who's in, you know, a position of privilege in a Global North Institute, um, well-established institute, da, 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 the, the, you know, how I can open doors for other people, right? Use my platform and, and concretely think about that rather than mentoring, whatever that means, right? Um, but it's work, you're right. It's all, 
this free labor. I mean, has anything, has the publishing industry thought about that? Have, you know, concrete ways of thought about how to? No, no, because the publishing industry is in the, like, I'm going to swear here, but the publishing industry, academic publishing is shitting their pants at the moment because open access means that they're going to lose all of the revenue, right? That they've been making on the free labor of academics. So you don't get paid for what we write. Yeah. Right. You tell this to like, like, anyway, it's anyway. So they are not the people they're there. That's so they're like panicking, looking around for new revenue streams. Like how can we get new revenue streams? Cause we're going to lose this. Right. So there's all kinds of different ways that they're trying to do that with their new packages of read and publish and, you know, trying to, yeah. I mean, that, that's a whole other conversation. Mm -hmm. um, but no. So publishers is not where you look. Um, journal editors might be where you look, but again, journal editing is a huge job and universities are reluctant to support that properly because it means, so, so my institution, I had to fight for it, but they've given, they, they've, they've supported me in doing this role because it's important for scholarship, but that was a fight and it's not enough. So I got some, a little bit of time relief because I do, because I'm doing this job. But a lot of institutions at the moment will not provide any relief for this kind of job. So then who's going to do it? It's going to get worse because it's going to be only the people at the institutions able to afford that kind of stuff. Do you sort of see what I mean? So it's not, I'm, I'm not painting a very nice picture. The other thing I wanted to say about your, um, your, your point about like allyship or what we can do, right? Like the first part of the piece is opening doors for people, absolutely. And, and, and secondly, creating more space, like just, just actively like getting in and creating more space for, for mm -hmm. more voices, uh, for, for um, early career researchers, for PhD students, for people from the global south, for marginalized voices, for all kinds of different, um, different angles. And then the third part, which is the part nobody wants to talk about, is that some of us have to get out of the way. Like some of us have to get out of the way. And, and I include myself in that, right? So my, my editorship ends at the end of this year. And like, it's time for me to like, it, like back up. And, and other people need to, need to get moving into these roles. And I, you know, I will keep getting asked to do these things. And I'm, some, sometimes I do want to. And part of the question that I have to ask myself is, if I do this role that somebody asked me to do, will I be able to, use it to open more doors for people. That has to be the metric that I'm gonna use now. Mm -hmm. Not, will it further my career or will it like make me rich and famous? It's, can I use it to open doors for other people? And some, sometimes if the answer to that is yes, then that, that, that would make me do it. But also if it's just about like, you know, uh, there's a times where I should say no because I need to get out of the way and let someone else do that. I think that's a tricky one. I think, and then I don't think it's a conversation we're having actually, and we need to have it. Yeah, I mean, I was going to ask that it just, you know, um, I mean, your comments and think, uh, you know, thinking about this is so really reflective. Um, and as Jim highlights too, really sobering and important, important conversations. And I just wonder, you know, you reflecting on the broader publishing. Are these conversations beginning to happen? Is the conversation around decolonizing knowledge around inclusivity around scholars and scholarship is this actually starting to take holds or uh, or not do we have some hope or not uh okay so i don't use the word hope i'm not going to use that word okay. we can talk about that for like 20 hours but um about why so i would say that let, let's talk about this in relation to say the ISA, because this is a journal of the ISA. Right. And, and every journal, every editor of those journals will have a different answer for you. My general read of it is that the conversation is happening around gender because it's an easier conversation to have. I'm not saying like, I mean, there's all kinds of mm -hmm. math ways that that um, patriarchy still rears its head in in gross ways and and in, in new and subtle and pernicious ways but it's an easier conversation to have and the interventions there are more of them and there's more people on board there's more consensus on it so those issues are being discussed and there's discussions especially around the covid stuff around around what that's going to do so one of the arguments i've been having is that this is not something that you intervene in like now and that's it because the 
the long tail of COVID is going to last for a long time. So yeah. this drop off of, of submissions from female authors is really, really worrying. And because it's not like it's going to be like, oh, never mind. In like December, it'll all change and everybody, you know what I mean? Like the tail of this is huge. So we need to keep our eye on that ball, I would say. So those conversations are happening around gender and that's good and that's important and we should keep having them and all the things. But the conversation around Global South scholarship, and I understand the problems with those terms, and I, you know, we can talk about that as well, is really hard. And, and it's very hard for people to have the conversation. And when the conversation happens, in my view, it's too often happening in a way that is reproducing a logic where it's us teaching them how to do better at what we do. I, I'm, I can't put it any more simply than that. Mm -hmm. I'm probably complicit in that as well, right? So I'm not, I'm just saying, and so the, the, the recognition of complicity in that system requires that you start from a position that says the system is broken. And I feel like I'm the only journal editor that's willing to say the system's busted, guys. And a lot of my colleagues will be like, no, 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 we can, it's fine. We just need to fix it. We just need to do this. We just need to do this. So we're not really having the same conversation. That's my view. I could be wrong. Maybe there's surprises out there, but that's my view. And so I'm, my question for myself and for my co-editors and for the IPS community is, what does this look like if we start from that position, right? right. What, what would IPS as a journal look like? So there's a new team taking over uh, January 2022. And I'm super excited because it is a really diverse team. It's a much, much bigger team, which is great. And they have representation all over the globe. And that's fantastic. It's what we weren't right. able to do. And so I'm like, I'm super happy about that and what that's going to mean in terms of how they can shake things up. That's great. That's so great. Cause I mean, I think what you're talking about reminds me of, um, it's a book that just came out this year. Um, Sylvia Tamayo, she's, um, it's called Decolonization and Afrofeminism. And she's a scholar oh. from Uganda. Anyway, um, there's a particular chapter in there where she talks about uh, the intellectual moves of feminism on the African continent and the difficulties in even running journals that were specifically designed to encourage and illuminate the knowledge production around that. And it was just, you know, what you're saying is generally um, these issues um, get relegated to women's studies departments that then underfund, under-resource and just the pure labor, let alone, um, you know, material implications of trying to have a journal that remains open access away from paywalls that she, it's a, it's a chapter, if anyone's interested in understanding kind of the political economy around knowledge production, particularly in feminist knowledge production in the African continent, I recommend that chapter. Um, yeah. Yeah, that highlights very much that. Jim, you have another question. Go ahead. Yeah, no, thanks. It's really interesting. You guys getting me all uh, riled up here thinking about this stuff. Uh, I'm thinking about when uh, in the 80s, there was this big uh, shift in the area studies programs in the international affairs schools, because as we know, uh, they were derived from how the OSS was set up in World War II and the needs of fighting uh, global war. And then they were intellectually taken into the universities. Uh, I came through that kind of system. And what I always understood about it was the financing of it depended on what global threat faced the United States. So you had a lot of money going into Russian studies, a lot of money going into Chinese studies. Then, of course, when they discovered the third world after decolonization, a lot of money went into Latin American and African studies. And then it flowed back out. So there's been this inconsistency at the federal level in the United States to say, OK, these areas of the world are worthy of uh, people understanding uh, in depth what goes on in them for our own purposes, our own self-interest at the same time uh, to have that permeate into the public's uh, knowledge about this. And so I see that as one problem in what you're talking about. Now, when you talk about the sort of rise of the, you know, what is left of all the different kind of. Uh, intellectual revolutions of the 60s into the academy, such as feminism, et cetera, and gender studies. I'm pretty sure that is rather well covered. The problem, of course, is that then, to me, it becomes a focus of attention and ignores everything else that has to do with these other areas of the world. 
uh, because you know feminism is important and feminism is uh, crucial, but on the other hand, it's just part of the picture, not the whole picture. And so how I am curious about what you guys think about how the academy can handle this is how do you think they're going to be able to deal with these dissonant voices that we see around the world? Because they've been basically distancing themselves from this for the past 20 years. I think the global war on terror has imposed an intellectual framework that tends to uh, intellectualize the other, the dissonance of what, what's coming out of the third world and overemphasize the negative in the third world. So for example, if we look at Africa, we're only thinking about Boko Haram, Al-Shabaab, or what's going on in Mozambique. All these other issues that are going on in Africa tend to be ignored. You know, and there's certainly a lot going on in Africa, for example, that counters this negative attitude uh, or perception. So those are the kind of things I think that filter into the academy and tend to sort of sway how the academy looks at the rest of the world. And it's, I, you know, I don't know what to do about it. I just, uh, you know, I'm a journalist. I've been a journalist for 50 years. So I just left the academy. <laughs> I just said the hell of it. But um you know, but I, of course, have to depend on the academy because it's part of my uh, bread and butter to understand what's going on and criticize it or learn from it. So I just wondered, you know, and, and it's great to hear someone in ISA actually thinking like this. It's really exciting, frankly, because uh, uh, I knew some of the male editorial <laughs> folks in the past and they certainly weren't into this. So but thanks a lot. It's really great to hear you guys talk. Um, yeah, Jim, thanks. Thanks. I mean, it's also like the thinking back to Amanda's point, like it's also about the histories of knowledge production, right? The global histories of knowledge production. And if we don't have a handle on that, then we can't answer any of these questions about journal publishing or whatever, because that's part of what this is. So like, does, does knowledge production have a geopolitics? Yup. <laughs> and is it, is it a colonial one? Yup. So it's, so that's part of this part of trying to understand this. I do want to say though, um, yeah, so like there's a, this, this is just a wider question. On, this is specifically about the discipline of IR, which is which I've come up in, but always with one foot resolutely outside of it elsewhere. Um, is to say there's there's two things. One is is to trouble like what we think counts as IR. So you were talking about like whatever an overemphasis of the negative, right? So when we think about Africa, we just think of Boko Haram and 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 et cetera, or or migrants, you know. Um so part of what the, the critical turn in IR has done is say is, is to broaden that landscape, to say like, guess what? There's a whole series of other things that count as international, as global, as, as valid objects of study for, for global politics. So that's thing one. But thing two is also to look at those conventional things like security, like war, like violence in new ways to unearth and expose all of the different angles, perspectives, and contours that conventional approaches have just ignored. Gender is a great example of that, but there's mm -hmm. others as well. So I think like it's a it's a kind of an overwhelming picture when you sort of think about it's not just this is what I'm why I wanted to talk about it in terms of content and form because it's not just about the substance of what we are studying. It's about the way that we are studying it, the approaches to it, the epistemologies we're using, the methodologies we're using. And the one thing, this is slightly a slight tangent, but actually I think it's really important and related. The way that we teach PhD students, ECRs, questions about method, right? And methodology is shockingly bad, shockingly mm -hmm. bad. It's mm -hmm. just embarrassing, really. Yeah. I have to agree with that. And I think, I mean, I, I think your intervention around the colonial model, no, uh, models of knowledge, right? Certainly um, feminism is, it, you know, carries that with it too, right? What, what yeah. feminist voices are heard, you know? And so, yeah, yeah so um, for the longest time, we've generally heard, you know, feminism largely articulated from a Western generally white, generally a middle-class kind of positioning, right? And this, and so, um, yeah, so I think, you know, fem feminism as a subfield or particular approach to understanding international relations has had to reflect upon that hard too, and how we encourage, 
different voices of feminisms in understanding um, experiences, gendered experiences that brings in queer bodies, that brings in uh, women of color, you know, um, disabled, all of those um, uh, all of those aspects, which again, why I think IPS is such a fantastic journal is its remit is about that, right? It's about beginning with those sorts of questions um, and, and what that what that then tells us about global politics writ large as well too. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I don't, I don't just There's so many different rabbit holes we can go down, Debbie, of just talking about this broader knowledge. But I just wonder, and, and probably for the recording too, and people who couldn't make it now but want to listen um, later, I'm going to ask those banal practical questions of you yeah. as well too. Yeah. So as a, yeah, as I guess a PhD student who's looking, you know, uh, has aspirations of going into academia from that position, um, would you recommend them sign up to be reviewers? Would you, is that, is that a skill set that you would recommend them to do? Or is that something that, I know we've just talked about all the free labor, right, that's done in this. So putting, you know, that aside, is that a particular um, strategy you would ask people to, PhD students to get involved in reviewing? Uh, I, yeah, but in a way that's manageable, right? So yeah. I've had conversations with other editors where they're like, oh, would you send, would you send a piece to a PhD student to get reviewed? I'm like, yeah, yeah but we, yeah. we send a lot of our pieces to PhD students. They're brilliant, like absolutely brilliant because they're experts on whatever it is that, I mean, really, really good. Um, but I guess, you know, I guess that it's, it's a tricky one because it's about, they need to understand that this is part of what a, the professional life is about right reviewing each other's work and it has to become embedded into what they do right from yeah. the start now that you do that because even in your research you're reading someone else's work and you're forming a critical approach to it or an understanding of it but then you do that in any way but then how would you translate that into an actual peer review so so absolutely i would but also under the understanding, I always want to say whenever talking about PhD students and ECRs is like it can only be done under the understanding of all the other things that you have to do. So right. I guess the one way to think about that would be to say what we're telling PhD students that they have to have in order to be to be like competitive on a global job market. Mm -hmm. What we're telling they have to have is 100 percent impossible. Right. Nobody can have it. Yeah. Right? Nobody. It's totally fictitious. It's impossible to have this. And so it's like all these people scrambling up this ladder to get as close to that as possible. And peer review is another one of those things that people are like, yeah, yeah, do that, do that. That'll make you more competitive. I understand. That's what I mean. The system is broken. But yeah. I'm saying, I'm saying it, it might be something that PhD students and ECR students can do to, uh, to understand and, and, and inculcate them into a system of academic sort of critical review and peer review and response because that is that is how it how it works so you have to know how it works right but it also it just makes you it makes you better it makes you better at spotting what's a good paper and what isn't it makes you better at understanding how people make arguments mm -hmm. and that's just something you just have to learn it but you learn it by doing it that's the that's the best thing to do but you also learn it by seeing it by engaging with it and by reviewing it yeah I mean, I, I totally agree. My brief stint on the um, editorial team for Politics Journal, I learned so much about, yeah, what, what makes a good paper um, or what makes a good article? What are kind of the key, um, you know, our, um, architecture of, of a good article? And um, yeah, so I would totally agree with that. I wonder too, I guess if someone is considering submitting to IPS, what would be the top three tips that you would give them? Love the list, right? Top three, Debbie. Um, okay, so the first one I think I've mentioned, which is fit. Yeah. Yeah, don't submit to IPS if it's not an IPS paper. Okay. That's the biggest reason for, a de for, for any journal, but the biggest reason for a desk reject is like, this is not IPS. <laughs> it might be a brilliant paper on like, yeah political economy or something else but if it's not directly addressing what ips is and what it does and engaging with the debates that we've developed for a number of years then then this isn't the journal 
there'll be another journal that's for you, but this isn't it. Like it's IPS is a specific beast. Yeah. yeah. There are other journals that are much more generic, like uh, about IR. So mm -hmm. review international studies, um, EJIR, you know, that are, that are yeah. specific to IR. And there's one specific to security, European Journal of International Security, Security Dialogue, you know what I mean? So, yeah. but IPS is a, is a thing, it's a genre. So the question of fit is, I think, super important. The next one would be uh, a, a sort of about this bigger piece about uh, revision and critical feedback. So I had a, a colleague when I was starting out say to me, oh, just, just chuck it in, just chuck it in and get, and get feedback, right? And I totally disagree with that. A, because you're using people's time, reviewers' time. And so you want to make sure that what you submit is the best, the best thing that it can be. And that means you are responsible, not just for self-editing and self-revision, but for getting critical feedback from critical friends, peers, mm -hmm. mentors, supervisors in advance of you submitting it. Because you don't want to waste people's time. And if you just chuck any old thing in just to get feedback, it's not fair because the system's broken, right? If the system wasn't broken, then whatever, who cares? But it is. So just respect. Yeah. You know, respect that. Respect that. Um, I would also say strategically, it's important to pay attention to the introduction uh, and the abstract. And in doing that, you have to let the argument do the work. So often we get people that are going like, you know, this is what I will do, or or like this is what I will do instead of just like just do it. Don't yeah. don't spend all this time signposting what you will. Just do it. And secondly, we get a lot of like contextualization. This is because we're taught badly. We teach writing badly, right? So we had a lot of contextualization of like you know for two hundred years people have said this, and then they, and then the, you know, and then it's like page sixteen. Here's my original contribution. You're like, don't do that. Don't do that. Like just tell me what the original contribution is. Um, and then just finally, like I'm going to sneak another one in, it is respect the review process, right? So, so it's not perfect, but it's what we have. And you are going to get decisions you disagree with. You're going to get rejected. I get rejected. You get rejected. You're going to get rejected, right? Um, when you get rejected, it's important for you to work out what to do about that. And here's what not to do. Do not fire off an email to the editors within half an hour of receiving a decision that tells the editors how wrong they are and how great you are. Don't do that. That happens a lot, right? A lot. And not just from like from established scholars. Don't do that. Write that email, yeah, but send it to yourself and then sit on it for 48 hours and see how you feel after that. Um, and then when you do get feedback, constructive or otherwise, sit with it for a while, get upset, do what you need to do, take care of yourself and then put on your big girl pants and go see your critical friends, your supervisors, your peer mentors or whatever, and discuss what it means. Because chances are there's something in that review that'll make your paper better. Not yeah. everything maybe, but like there'll definitely be something in there. Yeah, I think that's you know important and it, it is um, an important part of the process. The last point too, that regardless if you're early career or established senior professor, you're gonna get rejections of, of your pieces, right? And I think, um, there needs to be more sharing of that, you know? Oh, yeah. I had one paper that was rejected by four journals before it was finally picked up. Oh. Um, and it was, it's fine in that, you know, you're right. Each kind of um, revision process made the, made the argument clearer. Cause part of this is you think, you know, your voice and then you don't really have it. Right. And so it, yeah, it took those many revisions um, to finally get the piece, but it's also, I believed in that paper. I believed in that argument. There was something there. So there was um, perseverance with that, I think is also important in that yeah. just, yeah. And find your critical peeps, right? I think yeah. too, in that, you know, you can affectively unload on, they can support you. You can build a community there, but also, yeah, for critical engagement and to have people who um, don't tell you what you want to hear all the time, but also, you know, reflect upon, um, challenge you, right? Challenge your ideas. And this is what makes your papers and your arguments stronger as well, too. So just to add on, um, supplement your advice there, Debbie. So, um, so I think, um, yeah, I think we're coming to the end. I don't think there's any other um, practical advice for 
on from the perspective of the PhD that I can think of at the moment. Um, no, I'm sure if there's more, it'll be circulating through Twitter, right? They can follow up with different questions too. I just wanna thank you so much for your time today, Debbie, for talking to us in very real, not the toxic positivity terms of, you know, just do this and this and this and you'll be fine. But, you know, a sobering reality that we're in, um, you know, colonial and gendered structured models around publishing and that these have real implications that, significantly condition how we work as academics and work in publishing and who gets published. Um, so yeah, I think this conversation is important and it's great. And I'm, I'm so happy that we can have this with you today. I'm just going to, I guess, give the, the floor to you if you have any less comments before, before we sign off. Uh, no, thanks so much. That I mean, just for any opportunity to kind of engage with people who were publishing, they don't really know how it works, or it, or no one's told them, or you know, that that's always a good uh, a good position to be in. But um, I mean, I would just, I would just, I don't want to underestimate like writing and publishing. Writing in particular is is hard work. Like it's hard work, and the only way to get better at it is to just do more of it. And mm -hmm. I don't mean do more of it and then publish it. I'm just saying do more of it so you get better at it. Uh, and I do think that there's more work to be done on how we teach each other how to write and how and what we think good writing is and not. Like that's something for IPS definitely, but for also for lots of other critically and diverse oriented uh, approaches. I do. I still think that that's a conversation we need to learn to have with ourselves. Yeah. 